Hello, and welcome to my research project for History 365 Medieval Spain. My name is Will Hanlon, and in this podcast, I will be examining the lives of two men during the 11th century in Granada, Samuel ibn Negrela Hanagid and his son Joseph ibn Negrela. These two men were fairly unique in terms of their positions of authority over both Muslims and Jews in the Taifa Kingdom of Granada, but their lives ended in very different circumstances. Samuel was a politician, a military leader, and a poet, serving as vizier or chancellor to the Granadan king and Nagid or prince of the Granadan Jews. Samuel was extremely successful in his time with all this power, but he was under attack constantly by many enemies. These rivals of Samuel were either jealous of his position in the court of the Zirid kings of Granada, or they were angered by the presence of a Jew at a place of power over Muslims. Samuel never fell to his enemies, honing his diplomatic and military power to protect himself and his family. When he finally died in 1056, it was peaceful, and his son Joseph succeeded him as vizier in Nagid, but he seems to have been less strategically minded than his father. Joseph was a poet as well, and he received an excellent education from Samuel, but he was less able to deal with his critics than Samuel was, and this eventually resulted in his death. When Joseph was killed in 1066, a mass killing of Jews in Granada began. This pogrom resulted in 300 Jews dead and the Jewish community destroyed, having lost all its influence in the court. The story of Samuel and Joseph interests me immensely, as I find it so fascinating that where the father succeeded, the son failed and he brought down so many more with him. The question of what was different between these two men and their situations is what drove my research, and I hope you find it equally as fascinating as I do. This podcast will be split into six sections, each dealing with a part of the lives, careers, and activities of these two men. Without further ado, let us begin. Part 1. From Cordoba to Malaga to Granada. Samuel Ibn Negrilla was born in the year 993 to an aristocratic Jewish family in Cordoba, the capital city of the Umayyad Caliphate. Samuel was very privileged in receiving the best Hebrew and Arabic education of the day. He was also accomplished in the Latin, Romance, and Berber languages, as well as studying with the leading Hebrew grammarians and halakists, Jewish legal teachers, of the time. With this advanced education, Samuel could have easily served in the court of the caliph, but he decided to stay a simple spice merchant in the city of Cordoba. The Caliphate of Cordoba was extremely strong when a man named Al-Mansur ruled as first minister under the Caliph Hisham II from 976 to 1002. But in the year 1008, Al-Mansur's son and heir Abd al-Malik died, and a series of claimants to the title of Caliph began to rise up. Muhammad, Suleiman, and even Hisham II again fought to take the throne, with more joining the fight as the years go by. This, however, led to the fall of the Umayyad Caliphate and the rise of the independent Taifa kingdoms of Iberia. When Berber troops conquered Cordoba, Samuel and his family were forced to flee the city. They headed to the southern city of Malaga, which was then ruled by a pro-Umayyad governor and would be friendly to them. Before I continue on with Samuel's story, I would like to read one of his poems. This particular poem is entitled On Fleeing His City, and it is about Samuel having to leave Cordoba while still in his youth with all the thoughts, feelings, and emotions that surround this event. On fleeing his city, and this in his youth on leaving Cordoba. Spirit splits in its asking, and soul in its wanting is balked, and the body fattened is vital and full, its precious being uneasy. But the modest man walks on the earth with his thought drawn towards sky. What good is the pulse of man's flesh and its favors when the mind is in pain? And the friends who fray me, their fine physiques and slender thinking, thinking it's ease or gain that drives me, pitching from place to place, my hair wild, my eyes charcoaled with night, and not a one speaks wisely, their souls blunted or blurred, goat-footed thinkers. Should someone unguilty hold back from lying towards height like the moon? Should he wait, weaving his light across him like a man stretching taut his tense skin, until he acts in the hear of his action, as he adds and then adds like the sea to his fame? By God and God's faithful, and I keep my oaths, I'll climb cliffs and descend to the innermost pit, and sow the edge of desert to desert, and split the sea and every gorge, and sail in mountainous ascent, until the word forever makes sense to me, and my enemies fear me, and my friends in that fear find solace. Then free men will turn their faces toward mine, as I face theirs, and soul will save us, as it trips our obstructors. The beds of our friendship are rich with it, 
planted by the river of affection and fixed like a seal in wax, like graven gold, in the widowed dome of the temple. May Yah be with you as you love, and your soul which he loves be delivered, and the God of sentence and ages is beyond both the sun and the moon. Life in Malaga was very similar to that of Cordoba for Samuel, as he continued his career as a spice merchant. The allegiance of Malaga changed from the Umayyads eventually, as the city came to be subject to the Taifa kingdom of Granada. This particular kingdom was ruled by a family called the Zirids, Berbers from North Africa that were invited as mercenaries and came to rule Granada in 1013. When the Caliphate of Cordoba collapsed, the Zirids declared their independence and ruled on their own. The Zirid king at the time was a man named Habus, and he had a katib, or scribe, that owned property in the city of Malaga. In fact, this katib's property was adjacent to Samuel's home. While the katib was away in Granada serving as king, his servants needed to send him letters informing the katib of the situation back home. Their servants asked Samuel to write these letters for them, and he did so. When the katib received these letters from Malaga, he was very impressed by them and saw that whoever wrote these must be extremely learned and scholarly. At some point in the late 1020s, this Khatib was given leave by King Habus to return to Malaga, and when he reached his home, he inquired of his servants about who wrote these impressive letters. The servants pointed out Samuel, and the Khatib told him about how impressed he was, and told him that he could not allow him to waste his time as a spice merchant in Malaga. The Khatib made Samuel his counsellor, making Samuel the counsellor of the counsellor to the king. Samuel moved to Granada in the late 1020s to serve the king, and the Khatib, and he excelled in his duties. Eventually, Habus's Khatib became deathly ill, and Habus came to visit him on his deathbed. Habus was extremely distraught about the loss of his counselor and Khatib, as the advice he had given him was exceptional. The Khatib, however, informed him that none of the advice he spoke to the king was his own. They belonged to Samuel ibn Nagrilla. The Khatib begged the king to listen to Samuel and hold him in high regard, and Habus agreed to do just that. Samuel was made Khatib and counselor of the king in the late 1020s, and as he proved his worth to the king, more and more power won his way. In the primary sources that I used for my research, there was a bit of an issue that arose between the Jewish and Islamic sources. In Abraham ibn Daud's Book of Tradition, Samuel is referred only to as a Khatib and a counselor, whereas in many of the Islamic sources, Samuel is called vizier. The solution I am proposing, at least for the purposes of this narrative, is that both of these accounts are true. Samuel was probably appointed Khatib and counselor first, and only after serving for a few years and proving himself to Abus was Samuel named vizier. By 1027, Samuel was made Nagid of the Granadan Jews, and it was by the 1030s that Samuel had been appointed to the positions of vizier in general. In the span of around 20 years, Samuel had risen to become one of the most powerful men in Granada, and arguably one of the most powerful Jews in between biblical and modern times. Part 2. Surviving the Critics Samuel ibn Negrilla Hanagid was an incredibly talented man, and this quickly led him to become one of the most powerful people in post-Caliphate Iberia. By the 1030s, Samuel had become the vizier and general of the Kingdom of Granada, Nagid of the Jews, and an accomplished poet. Samuel's place of power in Granada was a source of strength for the Jewish community, but not everyone was happy with him in that position. Some in the court were envious of his viziership and his close relationship with King Habus, while others were angered by the fact that a Jew held a position of power over a Muslim. A dhimmi, meaning person of the book, was not supposed to be able to control a Muslim in fundamental Islam, but in the Taifa kingdoms, fundamentalism was not the norm. There were other Jewish viziers from time to time in Muslim Spain, but none were as powerful as Samuel. One of his frequent critics was a man by the name of Ibn Hazm, a Muslim poet and a contemporary of Samuel. Ibn Hazm most likely fell into the category of those who hated Samuel because he was a Jew in power. Ibn Hazm would frequently attempt to distribute libel, written defamation, against Samuel to try to ruin his reputation and potentially get him killed. Ibn Hazm was more successful in dirtying the historical record than some historic historians realize, as a work that is frequently attributed to Samuel was not actually written by Samuel, but falsely attributed to him by Ibn Hazm. This work was a polemic or strong written attack against Islam, and would have gone entirely against Samuel's character to create and publish. 
Samuel would not have endangered himself and his family by openly criticizing Islam and the Quran, as this would have been suicide for not only him and his family, but the entire Jewish community of Granada. The work itself was also based on finding contradictions in Quranic verses, but this would have required a deep familiarity with Islamic holy texts that Samuel just would not have had. The true author was most likely a Muslim heresy leader named Ibn al-Rawandi, and scholars think that Ibn Hazm probably knew that when he attributed it to Samuel. Ibn Hazm and Samuel's other critics would never succeed in getting Samuel either fired or killed, but there were times where Samuel's enemies came close. When King Abus of Granada died in 1038, Samuel was in big trouble. Habus had been his biggest supporter and had kept Samuel's critics at bay, never letting them harm Samuel. But now that he was dead, Samuel felt like it all might come crashing down. There was a bit of a succession crisis in Granada with Habus dead, as there were multiple claimants to the throne. Badis, the son of Habus, was the most likely candidate and the one Samuel supported. But there were others with their own supporters. Depending on the source you read, the claimants are different. In Abraham ibn Daud's version, it is Badis's brother, Balugan, and if you read the Tibian by Habus's grandson, it is Badis's cousin, Yadir. In either circumstance, Samuel backed the right man, and Badis Heben Habus rose to power as king of Granada. Luckily for Samuel, Badis respected Samuel profusely, as he saw how Samuel had helped his father achieve success many times. Badis also most likely felt a strong sense of loyalty to Samuel for helping him take the throne, as Samuel doubtlessly worked his magic to get rid of the competition. Samuel was secure again under the protection of Badis ibn Habus, but there were those that thought his position less secure than he did. One of those men was Zuhair, prince of the Taifa of Almeria, to the east of Granada. Under advice from his own vizier, a Muslim man named Ibn Abbas, Zuhair demanded that King Badis get rid of Samuel. Although Zuhair publicly demanded this because of Samuel being a Jew in such a place of power, it may be more likely that Zuhair and Ibn Abbas wanted to get rid of such an intelligent military strategist from serving their enemy. Badis refused Zuhair's demands, so their armies met at Alfuente to settle the score. Zuhair led the Almerians directly, while Samuel commanded the Granadan troops. This battle was recorded in poetic form by Samuel himself, and it will be the subject of examination later in the podcast. Suffice to say, Samuel won the battle. Zuhair was killed on the battlefield, while Ibn Abbas died in Granada's dungeons. This was the start of a very powerful partnership between Samuel ibn Negrela and Badis ibn Habus, as Samuel fought and won many battles for Badis in Granada. Samuel seemed to fuse his Jewish identity with that of Granada, as he made sure in his writings to identify Granada's enemies in biblical terms, making them enemies of the Jews as well. Any victory for Granada was then a victory for all of Israel and his people. He was able to achieve this due to the blatant anti-Judaism of many of Granada's enemies, so beating them helped both the Muslim and Jews of Granada. Part 3. Samuel's Mighty Pen Samuel ibn Negrilla was a very accomplished poet, but the poetry he was most famous for were his war poems. Samuel merged the styles of the Arabic tribal war poet and the Hebrew psalmist together to form his own unique poetic form. There are specific components of a typical war poem, both in the original Arabic form as well as in Samuel's own poetry, and these are 1. The circumstances and causes of the war. 2. Description of the enemy and of the contending armies. 3. The advance of the armies. 4. Immediate preparations for battle. 5. The battle. 6. The divine intervention. 7. The victory and a description of the defeated enemy. And 8. Thanksgiving and diffusion of the good news. Using these components and some other motifs of Samuel's war poetry, I will be examining the Battle of El Fuente a war poem by Samuel about the events surrounding the death of Habus in 1038, the ascension of Badis to the throne, and the war against Suhair and Ibn Abbas. First, the circumstances and causes of the war. Samuel describes how Zuhair of Almeria and his vizier Ibn Abbas were enraged by the fact that Samuel held authority over Muslims. So Ibn Abbas spread slander and lies across the land, hoping to turn the Muslims of Granada against Samuel. But King Habus would not be swayed by this. However, Kinabus died, and Samuel describes his fear as he had lost his protector. Samuel tells how his enemies were certain that Samuel was Finnish, but Badis came to the throne and made known his protection of Samuel against those who had threatened him. 
Zuhair and Ibn Abbas wrote letters to Badis to inform him that it was a sin to spare Samuel's life and that all kings of Andalus had formed a league against Badis, to which Badis replied that he would never give up one of his own men. And because of this, Zuhair raised his troops to go to war. Second, the description of the enemy and the contending armies. Samuel describes the Almerian army as a league of Slavs, Christians, and Arabians, and they were amassed at the town of El Fuente between Granada and Almeria. Third, the advance of the armies. Samuel describes Uher as making his army march at double time, rushing to battle like a hawk that rides the breeze. He also describes how both armies take up positions on either side of a pass, each facing the other. Fourth, the immediate preparations for battle. As soon as the armies are facing each other on either side of the pass, Zuhair attempts to turn them against Samuel with his words, but Samuel's men stood with him despite it all. On seeing this, Zuhair and his men prepare to attack, and both sides make ready to fight, and if necessary, die. Fifth, the battle itself. Samuel describes the fight between the two armies in a very bleak manner. He says that the ground was shaking beneath them, the sky was darkened, he describes the spears flung and the arrows shot through the air. Swords were described as brands, putting out another's light. The blood of men was running on the ground like ram's blood in the temple of the Lord, he writes. Then valiant men threw away their lives without a care, for they preferred to die. Lions of war they were. The wounds that bled about their heads were crowns to them. At this point, the battle does not seem to be going well for the Granadans, which leads us to the next component. Sixth, the divine intervention. Samuel feels that he has nowhere to run in battle, no one to trust except for God. He hurls prayers to God, asking for his help in the battle, not because Samuel is a good or holy person, but because it is in God's own interest to help Samuel, just like God has helped the Israelites before. And so Samuel describes how God answers his prayers by coming down and decimating the Almerians. The fire of death consumed them all. They met their end like wood in a stove, and all my enemies were turned to dust, like straw consumed in fire. Seventh, the victory and a description of the defeated enemy. The heads of lords lay strewn about the ground, like figs that sell a thousand for a fee. Fallen princes' bloated corpses lay like full wineskins or women big in the womb. Slaves lay beside ma their masters, beggars next to kings, all one in rank. All turned to dun, unburied in the field they lay, they and the king Zuhair. Not one in ten, one in ten thousand survived, like grape unpicked at harvest ends. And Andalus was rid of Slavs, the host of Almeria crushed, her kingdom gone. They left their enemy to rot, captured Zuhair's vizier alive, and went on to conquer the kingdom of Almeria. Samuel claims that not one of his men did not return from the battle, a very interesting claim considering he described his army losing earlier in the poem. Samuel ordered the Almerian vizier Ibn Abbas to be put to death, and with that, victory was his. Eighth, thanksgiving and diffusion of the good news. Samuel gave thanks to God, killing Ibn Abbas on a Torah festival day, and spread the good news of the war when they got home. Samuel describes God's aid in the battle as another in the law and history of the Jews, a fulfillment of the ancient covenant between the Israelites and God. With Zuhair and Almeria defeated, Samuel's main enemies are gone, and he can rest. As he describes it, the end had come to hate and jealousy. Samuel not only made use of these typical components, but also had his own themes and motifs that really made his war poems both Jewish and his own. The description of his men as lions, the sense of fatalism his troops felt going into battle, extensive hyperbole, the frequent use of blood, destiny's subordination of God, biblical allusions and motifs, and the personification of death were all used by him. The most important characteristic of Samuel's works was that he projects the biblical word onto the people and events of his time, connecting himself with the Jewish past of God's salvation. All of these aspects of his war poems, combined with the typical characteristics I described earlier, demonstrate just how unique and talented Samuel really was. Samuel's poetry provides us with a glimpse into his worldview, and that is an opportunity that cannot be missed. Part 4. Samuel the Prince by the year 1027, Samuel ibn Nagrila had added another title to his name, Hanagid, meaning the prince. King Habus of Granada had appointed Samuel as head of the Jewish community of that kingdom, further cementing Samuel's power and influence. As we discussed earlier, Samuel was extremely well-educated. 
not only receiving an Arabic education and learning Latin, Romance, and Berber, but he was also instructed in Hebrew and learned from the leading Hebrew grammarians and legal scholars of the day. Samuel took this education to heart, and when he was made Prince of the Jews, he was sure to attempt to provide such an education to many young Jews, both in Granada and abroad. Samuel ensured that anyone that wanted to to study the Torah or other Jewish texts would be able to, and he offered gifts to many Jewish schools and temples across the Mediterranean, especially those in the Holy Land. While Samuel was extremely devoted to his Jewish faith, he never openly attacked Islam, contrary to what Ibn Hazm and his critics would have you believe. Samuel was devoted to Judaism first, but he ideologically integrated his Jewish faith with his service to the Taifa Kingdom of Granada. He achieved this primarily through his poetry, as when he describes Granada's enemies, Samuel always seems to apply some biblical name or allusion, turning them into the Jews' enemies as well. Any victory for Samuel and the Granadans was also a victory for all of Israel, no matter where in the world. Samuel was loved by the Jewish community of Granada, but also by Jews in other parts of the world, and his patronage of Jewish learning and devotion to God were told of throughout the ages. Part 5 All I suffer and endure, it is on behalf of you. Although Samuel may be most famous for serving as vizier, general, nagid, and poet, the role he held most dear to his heart was that of being a father. Although we do not know much about his family, we do know that Samuel was deeply connected to his son Joseph. Joseph was Samuel's pride and joy. He provided him with the best education he could and attempted to teach him how to live a proper life, despite Samuel being away from Granada and his family for long periods of time. Samuel loved his son immensely and often wrote to him from the battlefield. Some examples of Samuel's love for his son are, My love for you is attached to the walls of my heart and to its feelings. And, Yosef, all I suffer and endure whenever I go in distress is on behalf of you. Samuel did not just want Joseph to be a wise man when he grew up, but a good man as well. Samuel hoped that his lessons on wisdom, leadership, quick thinking, poetry and literature, and moral character would rub off on Joseph. But unfortunately, it does not seem like Joseph took all of his father's advice, as we shall see in the next section. Before we move on, however, I want to touch on a topic that does not have a scholarly consensus at this at the point. That is the possible father-daughter relationship of Samuel ibn Grilla and a Hebrew-Arabic poet from Al-Andalus named Kazmuna. In several secondary sources that I have read, Kazmuna has been referred to as Samuel's daughter, as her love of poetry and mixture of Arabic and Hebrew traditions seem to indicate the possibility of a connection between the two. But some other sources have either not mentioned this claim or disregarded it altogether. In my opinion, Kazmuna is most likely not the daughter of Samuel, but I would not discredit the theory of there being some sort of familiar relation between the two. More likely than being Samuel's daughter, I could imagine Kazmuna as a niece or another close relative of Samuel and Joseph, but this has not been proven to be historical fact. I just wanted to briefly mention this issue. It directly pertains to a discussion of Samuel's family life, so I just wanted to make my opinion heard. Part 6. The Rise and Fall of Joseph In the year 1056, Samuel ibn Grilla finally passed away of natural causes. His enemies were unable to beat him in life, and only time could defeat Samuel. His son Joseph took over all his responsibilities, including the viziership and his role as Nagid. In the Book of Tradition by Abraham ibn Daud, Joseph is described as possessing all of his father's characteristics but one, Samuel's humility. Joseph had grown up in great luxury from the time of his birth in 1035, so he did not face the hardship his father had in his youth as a simple spice merchant, meaning that he was prone to the sin of pride, and this might have contributed to his downfall. Samuel attempted to teach Joseph how to attain wisdom and live a proper life, and one of these lessons has survived as a poem written by Samuel to his son. Take this book. Joseph, take this book that I have selected for you from the choice works in the language of the Arabs. I have copied it. While the killing spear was sharpened by our hands, and the sword drawn, and death decrees one army be exchanged for another, even life's time for its own demise. But I cease not from teaching you, though death's mouth is opened all about me. In order that wisdom may come upon you, for it is dearer to me than discovering my foes defeated." Take it and reflect upon it, and quit the crowds who deride language and speech. 
Know that the man of understanding is like a tree of sweet fruits whose leaves are healing remedies, while the fool is like the tree of the forest whose limbs and branches will be consumed by fire in the end. Like his father, Samuel, Joseph became deeply involved in the court intrigue of Granada, as there was always the problem of succession in the kingdom. Badis, king of the Taifa of Granada, trusted Joseph immensely, almost to a fault. Some have argued that eventually, as Badis fell into the vices of drink and distractions, that Joseph was given free reign to do as he pleased in Granada. Some of the other viziers and courtiers of the kingdom grew jealous of Joseph, and so they plotted with Belugan, son of King Badis, to kill Joseph. At first, these conspirators planted lies into Belugan's head, until he hated Joseph, and Joseph in turn hated Belugan. Belugan ibn Badis never actually made a move against Joseph, however, as he feared the repercussions from his father if he found out it was Belugan that was involved. Now, the story I have begun to describe comes from a chronicle by a, name, by a man named Abd Allah ibn Belugan, the son of Belugan and the future Taifa king of Granada, the grandson of Badis, the, current, the king in Joseph's time. And he accuses Joseph of a great many crimes. First and foremost, Abd Allah claims that Joseph killed his father Belugan. He claims that Joseph discovered this plot against him and decided to protect himself, killing Belugan before he could kill him. Despite the fact that Joseph and Belugan seemed to be rivals, they did drink together at Joseph's house from time to time. One of those nights, as Belugan left, he began to vomit all over the ground and collapsed. Eventually, he was able to pick himself up and make his way home, but he spent two more days in agony before dying. The accusation that Abdallah made was that Joseph poisoned Belugan while they drank, but two days is fairly slow for a poison, and if Belugan was poisoned, would he not have purged his body of the poison when he vomited? I think the story is more complex than Abdallah makes it out to be, but it would not surprise me if Joseph was not involved in some plot against Belugan. Abdallah also claimed that Joseph influenced Badis in such a way as to make him believe that Belugan's co-conspirators were in fact the ones responsible for his death, so they were either killed or sent into exile, depending on who it was. Joseph decided to take advantage of Belugan's death by finding a new heir to the Granadan throne, one who would be more amicable to Joseph and his interests. His attempts led him to choose Maxon, another son of Badis and brother of Belugan. Unfortunately for Joseph, Maxon was enraged by his actions and was worse to Joseph and the Jews than Belugan ever was. Maxon's mother was involved in plots of her own, and she did not trust Joseph and in turn turned to his maternal uncle, Samuel's brother-in-law, Abu al-Rabi al-Matuni, the Jewish royal bailiff. Joseph, so Abdallah claimed, grew jealous of this and again turned Badis against his enemies, causing Maxon's mother and a few other conspirators to be put to death. Abdallah even accused Joseph of killing his uncle himself, paying off the king with blood money to ensure there was no trouble. King Badis also ordered that Maxon be exiled from Granada, as he was worried that Maxon might plot to overthrow Badis and take the throne for himself with the help of the military. Joseph also planned for Maxon to be killed on the road, but this never came to fruition. At this time, Granada was facing trouble from the Almerians again, now ruled by an Arab dynasty. Ibn Sumadi, the Taifa king of Almeria, had replaced the Slav rulers of the past, the most famous being Zuhair, who we have already met earlier in the podcast. Badis of Granada was getting old at this point in history, 1066, and there did not seem to be anyone willing to protect Joseph if they became king. Therefore, Joseph turned to the Almerians for aid, promising them easy pickings in Granada in return for the safety of Joseph and his family. Joseph sent all the military leaders away from the city, while also depleting the garrisons of many areas of Granada of men and supplies. He promised Ibn Sumadi that he would face little resistance if the Almerians invaded now, and that is just what they did. The Almerians took control of many of the towns of Granada, but Ibn Sumadi was too afraid of attacking the city of Granada itself, which ultimately was the undoing of Joseph's plans. When the Muslims of Granada discovered that Joseph had plotted to betray them to the Almerians, his father's old enemies, they believed he had also killed the king and were ignited into a rage-filled fire that burned throughout Granada. Joseph was run down with his family in the citadel, being crucified by the mob in the courtyard, and the mob went on to kill many of the Jews in Granada. The numbers ranged from a few hundred to thousands, but the larger numbers were obviously inflated over time by chroniclers to make the event even more horrendous than it already was. Although the mob began their pogrom due 
through the perceived betrayal of Joseph, there was a general anti-Judaic sentiment that was spread among many of the Muslims in Granada. One of the potential contributing factors was a poem written by Abu Ishaq of Alvira entitled Qasida. There was a widespread debate among scholars regarding the authenticity of the document in terms of uh, chronology, whether it was made before the massacre or after. Considering the only surviving manuscript that contains the ode was produced two centuries after the massacre in 1066, and there is no mention of it in earlier sources, but it cannot be discredited entirely considering there's just not enough proof for either side. I would like to read this poem for you, even though it may be a later addition to the historical record, but it does capture the anti-Jewish sentiment of the Muslim mob that killed Joseph and massacred the Jewish community in Granada. Go tell all the Sanhaja, the full moons of our time, the lions in their lair, the words of one who bears them love and is concerned and counts it a religious duty to give advice. Your chief has made a mistake, which delights malicious gloaters. He has chosen an infidel as his secretary, when he could have, had he wished, have chosen a believer. Through him, the Jews have become great and proud and arrogant, they who were among the most abject, and have gained their desires and attained the utmost, and this happened suddenly before they even realized it. And how many a worthy Muslim humbly obeys the vilest ape among these miscreants? And this did not happen through their own efforts, but through one of our own people who arose as their accomplice. Oh, why did he not deal with them, following the example set by worthy and pious leaders? Put them back where they belong and reduce them to the lowest of the low, roaming among us with their little bags, with contempt, degradation, and scorn as their lot, scrabbling in the dunhills for colored rags to shroud their dead for burial. They did not make light of our great ones or presume against the righteous. Those low-born people would not be seated in society or paraded along with the intimates of the ruler. Badis, you are a clever man, and your judgment is sure and accurate. How can their misdeeds be hidden from you when they are trumpeted all over the land? How can you love this bastard brood when they have made you hateful to all the world? How can you complete your ascent to greatness when they destroy as you build? How have you been lulled to trust a villain and made him your companion, though he is evil company? God has vouchsafed in his revelations a warning against the society of the wicked. Do not choose a servant from among them, but leave them to the curse of the accursed. For the earth cries out against their wickedness and is about to heave and swallow us all. Turn your eyes to other countries and you will find that Jews are outcast dogs. Why should you be alone, be different, and bring them near when in all the land they are kept afar? You, who are a beloved king, Skyon of glorious kings, and are first among men as your forebears were first in their time. I came to live in Granada, and I saw them frolicking there. They divided up the city and the provinces with one of their accursed men everywhere. They collect all the revenues. They munch and they crunch. They dress in the finest clothes while you wear the meanest. They are the trustees of your secrets. Yet how can traitors be trusted? Others eat a Durham's worth afar while they are near and dine well. They challenge you to your God, and they are not stopped or reprove. They envelop you with their prayers, and you neither see nor hear. They slaughter beasts in our markets, and you eat their trefa. Their chief ape has marbled his house and led the finest spring water to it. Our affairs are now in his hands, and we stand at his door. He laughs at us in our religion, and we return to our God. If I said that his wealth is as great as yours, I would speak the truth. Hasten to slaughter him as an offering. Sacrifice him, for he's a fat ram. Do not spare his people, for they have amassed every precious thing. Break loose their grip and take their money for you have a better right to what they collect. Do not consider it a breach of faith to kill them. The breach of faith would be to let them carry on. They have violated our covenant with them, so how can you be held guilty against violators? How can they have any pact when we are obscure and they are prominent? Now we are the humble beside them, as if we had done wrong and they right. Do not tolerate their misdeeds against us, for you are surety for what they do. God watches his own people, and the people of God will prevail. The perceived betrayal of Joseph and the Jews to Almeria and the general distaste that many Muslims felt for Jews at the time led to one of the worst massacres in Iberian Jewish history, destroying the entire Jewish community of Granada in 1066. That community never fully recovered, really only for a short time before being again destroyed by the Almoravids when they arrived and invaded Granada in 1090. Conclusion 
To summarize, Samuel Ibn Negrilla and his son Joseph occupy their places in the history books for good reason. Samuel held an extraordinarily rare amount of power for a Jewish man in medieval Liberia, serving as vizier, general, and nagid, while also composing powerful poetry and raising his son. Samuel began his life under the Umayyads, fled from Cordoba during the fall, and rose to prominence in the Taifa kingdom of Granada. His role as a leader of both Muslims and Jews was unique, serving to preserve his legacy in both the Hebrew and Arabic scholarly traditions. Samuel was not only an effective political leader, but a powerful military one as well. Samuel famously defeated Zuhair of Almeria in 1038, recording his victory in a war poem, but following his devout nature, Samuel attributed his victory to God. Samuel was a very religious man, so he saw the world in such a way that God was always working in it, aiding the Israelites to fulfill his ancient covenant with them. Samuel's enemies could never defeat him, no matter how hard they tried, so Samuel died a natural death in 1056, leaving his son Joseph to inherit his positions and his responsibilities. Joseph was a smart and well-educated man, but he lacked his father's humility, and this ultimately led to him to fail where his father succeeded. Joseph became caught up in the Granadan court intrigue, much like his father, but he was unable to navigate it as smoothly, and he messed up one too many times. Abu Ishaq's poem, Casita, was not the cause of the massacre of 1066 in Granada, but it possibly may have served as a catalyst for strong anti-Jewish sentiment among the Muslim populace of the city. Joseph was killed in the citadel in Granada, crucified in the courtyard, and the Jewish population of the city was massacred. Although the exact number of Jewish people killed in the pogrom is unknown, it was enough that the community never truly recovered. A lesson to be learned from Samuel and Joseph is that the place of Jews in Muslim Spain was never secure, so the protection of the ruler and the complacency of the general public was necessary to survive. The Jewish courtiers of the courts knew that if they fell out of favor with the Muslim kings, their entire community might be made to suffer. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I really enjoyed making it, and researching the material to create it was a really rewarding experience. This course has been one of my favorites, and I'm really glad that we were all given the opportunity to research what interests us most. So, thank you for listening.